In these first areas of the game, we grappled a lot with the density and prioritization of the information we were conveying to the player. Playtesting showed us that players in VR were easily distracted, often due to better peripheral vision, such that they'd focus on one scene element while losing track of others. This was exacerbated in these first rooms because players were acclimatizing to being in VR often for the first time. In addition, different players progress at different speeds. We saw some players spend 30 seconds on the main balcony and others 30 minutes. As a result, we did a lot of iteration over the set opening areas, each time changing what information we tried to convey and where. Initially, the video call from Eli took place in the later refuge room with the snark and camcorder, but players were often too engrossed in interacting with all of the detail in that room to pay attention to the conversation between Eli and Russell. We moved the video call out to the starting balcony, but there it distracted from the establishing shot of City 17 and the Citadel. It also came at a time when players were still figuring out core game elements like movement and hand interaction with the world. That collision made simple things hard, like when to show the player a movement tool tip if they immediately started the video call. Eventually, we settled on inserting the greenhouse between the starting balcony and the refuge, which allowed us to move the call to an area with a slightly obscured vista and fewer interactable objects. This avoided the distraction problems and ensured players were past the initial gameplay moments of figuring out their hardware and movement setup. It also had the bonus of allowing us to add further detail to the opening balcony and Alex's refuge without fear of creating distractions from the video call. Beyond conveying critical information about the state of the world, the first two levels of Half-Life Alex also needed to demonstrate some of VR's strengths. Conveying a sense of scale is something VR does much better than flat screens, and our early playtests showed us that nothing quite sold that scale more than seeing a strider up close. In addition to the visuals, to fully illustrate the scale of a strider at close range, we needed to do a lot of work on its audio treatment. Players had strong expectations about feeling the weight, power and presence of the strider through its movements, particularly as it stepped on the balcony the player was occupying. In order to convey this power through sound, we layered multiple sound effects, allowing us to address ranges in the audio frequency spectrum and the temporal nature of those elements separately. We then combined those elements in the Source 2 audio engine to control them as one sound. This room, internally referred to as Alex's Refuge, was initially the location where the Eli video call took place. However, once that video call was moved out to the balcony, this room was freed up to solve other problems. In the Half-Life series, we've always tried to ensure that there's generally enough narrative for all players to understand where they're going and why, but for players who slow down and pay attention, there's more detail that can lead to a greater understanding. With the balcony being a place to get familiar with the game's inputs, the greenhouse being where the story kicks off, and the strider there to surprise players with spectacle, we decided that the refuge could be a quiet moment for players where they could discover more narrative detail in the environment. At the same time, it could be a place where they can play around a bit more now that they're acclimated to being in VR. Spending time in the refuge is meant to bring players into Alex's role in the resistance and her place in the world. We wanted it to feel like a real stakeout spot where Alex had been cooped up for weeks or months while planning the heist, doing research on the combine. The camcorder, snark, and whiteboards are all toys that respond to detailed interactions up for weeks or months while planning the heist, doing research on the combine. The camcorder, snark, and whiteboards are all toys that respond to detailed interaction and reward deeper investigation, giving curious players more information about the world of City 17 and what Alex has been doing in it. Two critical pieces of information that we needed players to understand were simple to state, but not so easy to convey, that players were playing as Alex Vance, not the Gordon Freeman they've played in all prior Half-Life games. 
and that Alex is going to speak, unlike Gordon. These probably seem obvious to you now, but until we focused on them, it wasn't obvious to playtesters. Ensuring that everyone realized they were playing as Alex was something we decided to hit with the biggest hammer we could and named the product after her. But even with that, we were very careful in Eli's video call to ensure it's reinforced immediately. Olga, the character introduced here, was added to further drive it home by calling out when the player exits the elevator. Olga is the first character the player meets in person, and her dialogue here and again ahead in the alley is aimed at driving home the fact that she's conversing with the player and that the disembodied female voice the player hears is Alex speaking back. This was harder to convey in Eli's video call because it already features Russell speaking off screen, whereas in this scene, there's clearly no one else around in the conversational space other than Olga and the player. Without Olga, we found that even though they had already spoken to Eli and Russell over the video call, playtesters still didn't feel like they were Alex. When we started Half-Life Alex, we were very curious to find out 